God is so good. Amen? Amen. Amen. God is so good. Oh, I don't. Here, I'll just set that aside. I had that in there because the Lord gave me a message that, and it's the message I'm going to preach this morning, but he gave me a message here sometime back. And it was one of those kinds of messages that I don't kind of preach very often, but yet at the same time, it's one that I believe is important, and it's one the Lord led me to. And it's, it's like I was going to do it Wednesday night, but it was too long. Would have been there too long on Wednesday night. And we try to keep, we try to get you in and out in an hour. So if you haven't been to our Wednesday night service, we do try to, we do try to watch that very close. But I thought, well, I think I'm going to preach that Sunday. So the pastor came up to me, oh, I think it was Wednesday night. My, he came up to me, asked me, he said, do you have any idea what you might be preaching? And I told him, absolutely, I do. I, I absolutely know. And that's, that's this message. But in order to preach the message, I've got to set the stage. And in order to set the stage, we've got to go through a couple of scriptures that I want to read for you. And I want to talk about a man's life, a man by the name of Abram. You may not recognize that name. You know him better as Abraham. But he got a name change. The name Abram wasn't a bad name. As a matter of fact, the name Ab Abram means lofty father or exalted father. In other words, he was considered by his dad to be somebody that was going to be kind of special in this world, and I think God thought so too. But lofty father. Abraham, when he first receives this promise from God, before his name is ever changed, he's 75 years old. How many, anybody here 75 or above? Well, there's a couple that are 75. I'm not, that's, my hand wasn't raised because I was above 75 because fortunately I'm younger than Abraham was when he started. But he was 75 years old. You know what that means? God can use old people. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how old you might consider yourself, he can use old people. He can also use young people just as easily. It all depends on your submission and my submission and our willingness to say, hey, Lord, use me. And then give him free reign to use you as he chooses to use you. I want you to, if, if you've got a Bible, you can read it with me, but it's in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And it says, now the Lord said to Abram, this is before he had his name changed, get out of your country from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those, or I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What a promise. He was going to bless all the rest of the world through Abram problem is, is at this particular point in time, Abram had no children, and his wife Sarah was barren. So if we fast forward about 11 years, Ishmael is born. That's their solution. Hannah gave, to, or excuse me, not Hannah, but Sarah gave to, his, to, to, his, to her husband, her handmaiden, so that she, he could have a son through her, thinking that, well, maybe that's the way God wants to fulfill this promise. While God does not reject Ishmael, at the same time, Ishmael is not the promised son. He's not the one that God was talking about. So, about fa so if you fast forward another 13 years, that's a total of 24 years. I did the math, and so I want to show off a little bit. A total of 24 years total. But if you fast forward another 13 years, you come to Genesis 17, verses 1 through 5. 17, 1 through 5. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. And then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of many nations. 
No longer shall your name be called Abram, but you shall be, your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you, look at it, listen to that, listen to what God says now. For I have made you a father of many nations. He's only got one child, not the son of promise. Abraham is not looking like the father of many nations. But he said, I have made you already, I've made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant. Abraham is now 99 years old. Again, God's not done using Abraham. That's his name now. That's his new name. Father of many nations. Father of multitudes, excuse me. Father of multitudes. He makes some more specific uh, conditions in terms of the promise. He tells them a little more specifically about the promise. He changes his name down in verse 5. Fast forward now for, for about a year. Genesis 21, 1 through 5. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore, a, bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time which God had spoken him. And Abraham called, his, called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore, Isaac. And then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. And now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. If that doesn't scare you, if you're less than 100, I don't know what will. Can you imagine having a son at 100 years of age? To set that in perspective, Abraham lived to be 176. So he's still got another 76 years to go. <clears throat> so he had a, he's got that promise made. Abraham lived to be at, well, 175. I, I misquoted that. 175. This is the sum of Abraham's years. This is how I know that. The, uh, the, the, of his years, of Abraham's life, which he lived. 175. Five years. And then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, a good old man, full of years, and was gathered to his people. And I want you to notice something here. Verse 9 And his sons, sons plural, Ishmael and Isaac, the only sons that are mentioned. That's not to say that Abraham didn't have other sons, because he did. He had six of them. He had six of them with his second wife. But they weren't going to be a part of the picture in the promise that God had made him. Of, of the Bible says, specifically, of all of the kids that he had with the concubines, he gave them presents. He gave them gifts. He, he probably made many of them rich, and he sent them on their way. And I have a feeling that's probably what he did with those other six children, because the only two that are mentioned that when he is buried is Ishmael and Isaac. And he's already promised, given a promise to Ishmael. With Isaac, he's, he's the only one that gets mentioned from hereafter in terms of the children of Abraham. It is now Isaac. Now, I've said all of that because it's kind of the setting the stage for what I, for what I have to say. Abraham's name meant father of multitudes. So Abraham was told by God, this is your name. So wherever Abraham went, wherever he journeyed for the next 70-some years, Abraham, whenever he was asked his name, he would tell them, my name is Abraham, meaning a father of multitude. I wonder how he felt about that. I wonder how those who heard him felt about that very claim. 
Because after all, Abraham by no means looked like a father of multitudes. He had, for, you know, for technical purposes, he had at, at most, even if you count the other six, he only had a total of eight sons. For me, I don't know about you, but for me, that's not a great multitude. That's a big number for me, but that's not a great multitude in terms of having kids. That's not a great multitude. And yet God had promised him, and so everywhere he went, here he is announcing to the world, announcing to those that asked him, my name is Abraham. And they knew that that name meant a father of multitudes. You see, in those days, names meant something. They're a little bit different. I have no idea what the origin of my name is. I really don't know. I think I might have been named for an uncle. I don't really know, actually. But I know my mom and dad came up with the name, but as far as what does the name Thomas mean, haven't got a clue. Don't know. Doesn't matter. Makes no difference to me because guess what? The, the, whatever the meaning might be, that's not, what is, that not, that's not what makes me who I am. Who makes me who I am? That's God. Amen. He working in my life. He working through me. That's, that's who makes me what I am. But this idea of, and, and here's one of the points I want you to get. This is what I was leading into, and this is why I went through all of that. The idea of declaring the promises over our lives started with God. Let me say that again. The idea of declaring the promises of God started with God when he renamed Abraham. Because basically what he was saying is, I'm going to make you the father of many. I'm going to make you the father of a multitude, and I want you everywhere you go, I want you to declare that promise. Whenever anybody asks you, who are you? This is who I am. I am Abraham. I am the father of multitudes, but you only have two children. I am Abraham. I am the father of multitudes, but sir, you only had two children. I am Abraham, the father of multitudes. I believe that everywhere Abraham went, there were those who looked at him just a little bit weird. It's kind of like when you and I begin to talk to, to those that aren't saved about some of the marvelous things that God's done for us and God's done in us, and they kind of give us a little bit of a look, like, really? Because they know us a little differently than the way God knows us. But we know how God knows us. And so what they think and what they say and how they feel, it doesn't really matter. You know, I, I, I appreciate kind remarks after I've preached a message. It helps not build my ego, but it helps get me up here the next time. But at one and the same time, to be honest with you, I don't really care what you think about my message. It doesn't matter to you, to me, what you think about my message. What I care about is that you hear my message. You see, this idea of proclaiming the promises of God, declaring the promises of God, whatever word you want to use, because that word declare is really a safe word. It simply means to say. That's all, to say, to, to speak the promises of God over your life started when God named Abraham. And Abraham serves as a great example that even in our darkest hour when we've only got two kids or six kids, or eight kids, excuse me, six or eight, whichever number you wish to use, God has not yet fulfilled that promise. And guess what? Abraham's going to die not seeing the promise fulfilled. And yet for 70-some years, everywhere he went, he would proclaim the name that God gave him. My name is Abraham, a father of multitudes. I want you to turn with me, if, if, if you've got a Bible, that's all right, and if you don't have a Bible, well, I guess you can't turn. Matthew chapter 12, verse 37, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. It's important for us to recognize that the things that we say about ourselves the things that we say to our children, the things that we say to our spouse, the things that we say to our friends, the things that we say to, to, to just about anybody that may come along, those words have powers. By your words, you're, and it's going to affect your life. By your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. God evidently thought it was pretty important. Matter of fact, Jesus did, because he's the one who said that particular verse. 
Proverbs chapter eight, or chapter eighteen, verse twenty-one. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Think about that. You can speak death into somebody's life, or you can speak life into somebody's life. The choice is yours, how you speak to them and how you say that. Now, that our words can obviously, by the, on, in those two verses, it's clear that our words can have a negative reaction. That's why God gave Abraham the name he gave him. He wanted him to understand who he was in God. He wanted him to understand that God had great plans for Abraham. Well, we understand the negative side of our words. We understand that, yeah, we can have a negative effect on other people. We understand things like, you know what, if we talk discouragement, that's exactly what we're going to reap in our life. Have you ever walked, have you ever met somebody who was going through a time when time period when they were discouraged and you asked them, hey, how's it going? And then they start the litany of things that are all going wrong in their lives. And they go through it one by one by one by one by one rather than recognizing that, wait a minute, God has something better for me. You want to, if you talk discouragement, that's exactly what you're going to reap in your life. You can actually talk yourself to death. Now, I know some may or may not, but you may or may not believe that, but let me, get, let me tell you a, a personal experience that I know about. I don't know if I shared this with you before or not, but one of the first g real jobs that I had was at a place called Weimar Medical Center. My grandmother got it for me, and I was serving as an orderly at that particular time. I was serving as an orderly in a tuberculosis re rehabilitation center. And they had this man come in who was in his early, very early 50s. What was interesting about this man is there was absolutely nothing wrong with him. But from the time he laid his head on that bed till the time that he died... He kept saying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. Every day, the nurse came in. If I walked in to attend to some of his needs, he would tell, he would say the same thing. I'm dying. And he said it with desperation. He said it in a weak voice. He, has, he was convincing himself that he was going to die. And sure enough, he didn't leave that hospital. He died. Your words have power. Your words, my words, we have power. It's powerful enough that if we repeat a lie often enough, people will believe it. I think it was, who was that, who was that famous radio guy, huh? Hitler? Who? Hitler? No, no, not Hitler, no. <laughs> famous radio guy, not, not Hitler. He, was, he might have been a famous radio guy. Oh, good grief. Rush Limbaugh. He was the first one I ever heard make that statement. That if you, if you say a lie often enough, eventually people will begin to believe it. As a matter of fact, if you say it often enough, you too will begin to believe your own lie. Even though you knew in the beginning it was not true. Yet we can convince ourselves that things are true that we know aren't true. If all we got to do is just keep repeating it over and over and over and over. Our, our words can affect others as well. I mean, it's as simple as that. James chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. We need to understand that our words can have a negative effect on the lives of many of those that are around us. So we only get from our children the things that we say to our children. If we treat them completely with disrespect, if we treat them in a, in a mean manner, if we treat them as if though somehow or other they're not special or they're not loved, then that's how they're going to feel, not loved and not special. Does that mean we shouldn't discipline our children? No, we discipline them out of love. But one of the things you got to remember is that when you're disciplining them, you let them know it's because I love you and I know that what you're doing is wrong and can hurt you and I don't want to see you do that again. Those are kind of words that I seldom heard from my dad when he was mad. <laughs> Didn't hear those. I heard a lot of other words, which let it go. 
But we need to understand the positive side as well. You see, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 22, whoops, it didn't go there. Let me get over here. Matthew chapter 20, or 11, verse 22. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable. Uh, wait a minute. I got the wrong reference, so we're going to skip that one. Yeah, because that, that went exactly where I wanted it to go. Let me go down here to another verse. Yep, no, we're going to skip that one. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna move on. When Jesus faced the devil in the wilderness, what did he use every time the devil came to him? The Word of God. And what did the devil do, do every time Jesus used the Word? He backed off. He didn't surrender, but he backed off. Why? Because the Word of God scares the bejeebers out of the devil. I don't know if that's, a, if that's the, a good word or not, but it's the word I'm using. Scares the daylights out of the devil because he doesn't know how to respond. There is no greater authority in your life or in my life than God's Word. Whenever we're faced with circumstances, whenever we're faced with challenges, we ought to meet those challenges, meet those circumstances with a promise from God. Because it's God's words that is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It is God's word that will put the enemy to flight. It is God's word that will build our soul and build our spirit. It is God's word that will strengthen us to the place that we can face whatever challenge that he may throw at us. Whatever challenge God may allow into our lives. When we turn to the word of God and speak the promises of God over our life, it always, always always has a positive effect on our lives. We need to learn to be word people. And I'm going to use a phrase that I hope you don't get mad at me and crucify me, but I believe it. Maybe not in the sense that you might have heard this before, but I believe that we need to be... Uh, oh, <laughs> now the phrase went out of my head. God must have said, don't do that. All right, fine. All right, but Lord, it was so good. Yeah, I know, but don't do that. Oh, but it would have offended people. Yeah, I know, don't do that. Actually, I forgot it. Verse 2, or not verse 2, second point in, in, under, under that idea is that Jesus spoke to sick people for healing. You know, one of the things I find interesting about the ministry of Jesus is that, and, and something that kind of varies from what I've heard it presented from, from others, is that oftentimes others will talk about how Jesus prayed for the sick, and he didn't. He never once prayed for anybody that was sick. He always spoke to them. He spoke to them and said, rise up and take up your bed and walk. He spoke to them and said, be healed. He spoke to them each and every time. He didn't, why? Because the word of God is powerful. It is sharp. You say, can, can we do that? Has God's word changed? Is, God wor is God's word less powerful for you than it is for Jesus? No, it is not. God's word is still as powerful as it always was. You see, the, the, and, and of course, the Bible says, I've got one more that's really important, and I want to get to that last. But the word of God is quick and is powerful, and it is the most powerful powerful thing in all of your life so when we speak to the sick you know should we lay hands on the sick and pray for them yeah why because the bible says so so don't misunderstand me i'm not one of these who say well we should never pray for the sick well that's not true because the bible tells us to but i want you to understand that jesus never did he always spoke he always spoke he always spoke and it was always god's word it was always what god wanted and god healed those individuals you see, like Abraham, we need to, every now and again, we need to hear ourselves declare the Word of God. Who does God think you are? Who does God think you are? He thinks you're, you're His beloved. He thinks you're His sheep. He thinks that you are special. He thinks that you are His gifted. 
He thinks that you have everything you need to not only live for him, but to live in a victorious manner for him. You see, when I first got saved, I didn't know any of that stuff. And for the first years of when I was saved, some, there were days where, man, it was pretty rough. But when I learned to wait a minute, hold on. God doesn't see me that way. God doesn't look at me that way. He doesn't look at me and say, hey, Tom, do you remember when? No, God's never said those words to me, not one time. And believe me, there's a lot of remembering wins that God could call back to my mind. But he never, ever does. He doesn't go down that right route. You see, God understands what we need to hear is what he thinks about our lives. He thinks you're powerful. He does. Why? Because he dwells in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. He is powerful. Jesus is powerful in and through you. You are a powerful person in, in the Lord. In the word of faith, that's what I was trying to get at. I'm one of them word of faith guys. It came back to me. The Lord said, okay, go ahead. It was good. It's all, I'll share. No, not really. I just forgot it, and it came back. All right. When we speak the Word of God, let me give you a couple more, then I'm going to talk about the one that's probably the most important. When we speak the Word of God, it puts fear into the devil, especially, especially, and I had to add this because it's true, especially if we believe it. Because a lot of times we, we speak the Word of God, but we don't really believe the Word of God. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. That's, that's a good thing. But too many times, we don't. Too many times, it's a matter of, oh, my goodness, you know, it's like, yeah. I, I, God's my healer, and I'm healed. Maybe. Hopefully. Instead of, no, God's my healer. And by His stripes... I am healed. What about the symptoms? What about the two kids for Abraham? God didn't change his name back. God didn't give him another name, say the, the guy that's only, he failed me, he only got two. No, God didn't change that at all. You see, sometimes when we, it, we, we declare God's word, but we really don't believe that God's word, we believe it's true, but not for us. We believe it's true. Have you, ever, have you ever said, well, you know, I've tried that. I've tried that saying God's word. I've tried that declaring God's word, and, and it just didn't work for me. Try it again. You know, I can remember when I was first learning to ride a bike. It was a catastrophe in the very beginning. But I didn't throw down the bike and say, well, you know what? There's no such thing as balance. I'm done trying to ride this bike. No, I wanted to ride that bike, and I knew because I saw my brothers riding the bike. I knew I could ride that bike. And so I kept at it until I got up on that bike, and it worked for me. And I think sometimes we as Christians, we give up way too easy. And if the devil knows that we're an easy surrenderer, he's going to come at you every single time, every single promise. He's going to come at you, and he's going to do his very best to create doubt and fear in your mind and saying, this isn't going to work for you. Don't you listen to that guy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And I'm here to tell you, based on my personal experience and what God has done in my life and through my life, that his word works. His word, he does perform his word. He is faithful to his word. God cannot lie cannot it's not possible for God to lie so what he says he meant when we do, when we speak the word of God it helps to build if we believe it and continue to believe it it helps to build faith in our hearts it honors God thirdly it honors God because it pays God probably one of the highest compliments you could ever pay God you know what that is I believe you I believe. Has anybody, ever, has anybody ever told you, have you ever experienced somebody who's accusing you of lying and you know you're not? Yeah. You know you're not, but they're accusing you of lying. I had a son that was, uh, oh, he wasn't necessarily a habitual liar, but boy, he was one great storyteller. No, I'm serious. That guy could on the fly make up a, make up a story. I think he gets it from his mother. could make up a story to cover whatever it was you wanted to question him about. And the that sad part was is he, he was a very intelligent child, and he had a command of the English language probably better than a lot of adults. 
And he could choose the right words to say to make it look like what you want to hear. And it is true, but it is not the truth. It's not the truth. I mean, it's, he just was absolutely good. But I told him, and, and I called him aside, and I told him, I said, you know, you need, to, you need to understand something. Have you ever been accused of lying and knew that you were telling the truth? He said, oh, yeah, I have. And I said, how did that feel? Well, it didn't feel very good at all. How would you like to spend the rest of your life, everybody, questioning whether or not what you are saying is true. If you get the reputation of being a liar, that will follow you throughout your life. And I wish I could say with those magical fatherly wisdom that, that I just demonstrated there, I wish I could tell you that he stopped immediately. But he's gotten a lot better. At least his stories are a lot more funny. <laughs> but I want to talk to you about probably the most important thing for me as I look at it. The most important thing that we need to recognize, or say, and be able to declare, I'll use that word for lack of a better word, over our lives. And I'm speaking not just to you that are here, I'm speaking to you that are here too, because one of the things that I have failed in miserably as far as trying to help people and trying to serve people is I've never been able to look into a heart. I've never been able to, dis, to know the motives of somebody else. You see, I believe there are some heart issues that God doesn't share with us about individuals. But I've never been able to look into a heart. And so when I say I'm speaking to, to somebody that may even be here this morning, it's not because I'm standing here as a judge, because I'm not. I don't know what's going on inside your heart. I don't know what your relationship with God is. I know what you present your relationship to be, just as you don't really know what my relationship with God is. You know what I present. And believe me, I'm trying my very best, to be honest with you, about who I am and what I am and, and what I can and what I cannot do. I try to be honest, as, as honest as I can, because I'd only be kidding myself if I wasn't. But the Bible says in Romans 10... And I want to start with uh, verse 8, actually. Let me go back up one more verse. But what does it say? The word is near you in your, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith by which we preach. And this is what he preached. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, what is the promise? You shall be saved. You know what it isn't? You might be saved. Maybe if you get a few things straightened out in your life, maybe then I can consider saving you. But he says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Now understand this, salvation is a heart issue. It's a matter of your heart. It's a matter of what's really in your heart. And there are two people that know what's in your heart, you and God. The Holy Spirit is involved in the mix because he's the one that brings a conviction that's needed in your life to show you that maybe there's something there that you need to address. And if you're watching by, by internet, if you're watching by the live stream, I would say the same things to you. I don't know where you are spiritually. Where's the camera? Here? Yeah. I don't know where you are spiritually. I don't know what you're going through, but God does. And if there's anything in your life or in your heart that needs to be cleansed, let God cleanse it this morning in the name of Jesus. Don't carry it another day. For you that are here, I say the same thing. Don't let what's in your heart that may stand between you and God, don't let that hinder you, but turn your life completely over to Jesus because if you've got, you've got to believe in your heart, in your heart, that's a word that you need to be able to say over yourself. Yes, I confess Jesus as my Lord, and in my heart, 
down here where it matters, in my soul, in my inner spirit. You label it what you will. But on the deepest inside of me, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Why is that so important? Because if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, this is all wasted time. And none of the promises are true. But he rose from the dead. How do I know that? Because in December 1973, I met Jesus for the first time in my life. I was raised in a, I hesitate to use the word church, in a church world where parents went to church. But I was taught more about, in Sunday school, I was taught more about Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon, and the doctrines of the reorganized Latter-day Saint Church than I was about Jesus Christ. It wasn't until I entered a Pentecostal church over here on South 7th. Pentecostal Church of God was a denomination. That's, that's who they belonged to. For me, denominations didn't matter a whole lot. But anyway, I heard about Jesus. And one night, an altar call was given, and I responded. And God washed me clean. And I got up from that experience, and I walked out the door that night. I walked out the church door that night, and I'm driving back. It's before Janet and I are married. I'm driving back to my apartment, and, man, I had to literally back my foot off the accelerator of the car because I was so excited about what God had just done in me. Something had happened. We, you, you know, I couldn't have explained to you at the time that it happened what had gone on, but what I did know, something happened inside my heart. Something happened in my life, and I'm telling you that God... God is no respecter of persons and if you are willing this morning you can give your heart to Jesus you might be fooling everybody else around you but you are not fooling yourself and you are not fooling God if he's drawing you don't resist don't fight it you go, what, what, what? people they're, 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 they're going to think ill of me there is not a person in here that's going to think ill of you because every one of them has made the same trip. Every one of them has made it. It may not have been like my experience. It may have been in a different place at a different time. It may have been under different circumstances, but every one of them have made that trip to that altar to surrender to Jesus Christ. Stand with me, if you will. I don't know what's in your heart. I'll confess that. And to be honest with you, I'm easily fooled. I am. You tell me you're a Christian, I'll believe you. You don't live like one, then I begin to question you. I don't throw you out the door just yet, but I really begin to wonder. Because Christians' lives change. Because that was the biggest thing that I know. There was a change in me. Has your heart been changed by the by the Lord? Have you been? Have you surrendered to Him? Have you said, "Hey Jesus, be Lord and Savior of my life"? I believe that You rose from the dead. I confess You as my Lord. Yes. Most important words you can say over your life. Heavenly Father, we pray right now that in the next few moments You would speak to hearts. Kylie, if I could get you to come back, please that you would speak to hearts. Because you and you alone, I can't, but you can. And I'm asking you for conviction, not only for those that are here, but those who are watching. Because even in their living room, they too can pray. They too can surrender, even at this very moment. They can get it right. They can say the right things. They can get it right. And you can change their lives. If you're here this morning, and I, I don't know how to go about this, I'm not sure how, I, it just doesn't matter how I go, I'd rather have it. Here's how I want to do it. 
I'm not looking to embarrass anybody or shame anybody. I've been there. But if you're here this morning and you need Jesus, I want you to come down to one of these altars and let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. If you know that on the inside your heart isn't right, then you need to come. If you're here this morning and you're wondering, is my heart right? You need to come. You need to come. Would you do that? Would you do that?